Go make disciples. Why are we going through all these things? It's not just to gain information in our brain, just intellectual knowledge to fill up our brains and be all like filled with, with information. We're doing this because we, um, a couple of things that I want to say, we're doing this because we want to know God. In John 17, it says that um, eternal life is that they know you, the one true God. And Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the one you sent, right? That is eternal life, that we know God. So we're doing this not just to know about him and have all this information, but to know him. Everything that we're covering here should help us uh, get in a closer and more intimate relation with God, with each other, with the church, etc. So that's why we're doing things. And the other one is who wants to be an effective disciple? I want to be one. And who wants to make disciples effectively? Yeah, that's that's the, the one thing uh, that Jesus said in, in Matthew 28. We read that Jesus said, go and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them, da, da, da. right? And uh, recently I heard this analogy and I, and I really liked it. If, if Kitty goes out like today and she's leaving us with the girls and with all the kids, but if she leaves and she says, hey, Reuben, we're going to have, um, I don't know, chicken soup on, on, on Monday. I need you to take the chicken out of the freezer and have it ready. And then she leaves and then comes back on Monday. What is she going to ask when she comes back? Is the chicken defrosted? Yes, is the chicken defrosted? Basically, did you do what I told you? And I'm not going to be able to say like, yeah. If the chicken's still in the freezer. <laughs> yes, I did, but chicken's still in there. Like, there's proof you'll, you'll see it, whether I did it or not, right? So what do you guys think this uh, Jesus is going to ask when he comes back? Did you do what I say? Where are the disciples? He crossed the chicken. <laughs> <Did you laughs> cross the chicken? The chicken. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I know where he's going with this. <laughs> That's right. So Jesus says, go out and make disciples. When he comes back, it's going to be, where are the disciples? I told you guys to make disciples. So we want to, we're doing this because we really want to know God. We want to know him, have a closer, intimate relationship with him. And we want to be an effective disciple ourselves, right? With our lives. But we also want to make disciples effectively. Keep that in mind. That That is the, the reason why we're doing, that's the why of this 12 month or 10 month uh, course that we're uh, study that we're doing okay um and the reason for that this is just a little more, more personal maybe to to challenge us is um just one of many things we just want to obey him and all that but i told you guys there's more than fifty thousand christian denominations last time and for many many years many many years christianity had been the fastest growing uh, religion in the world ratio was when you looked at how many people were getting uh, becoming believers and, and coming to the faith it was the fastest growing um, religion let's call it in the world but that is no longer true did you guys know that that is no longer true Christianity is no longer the fastest growing re uh, religion in the world and that ratio was if you took all Christianity lumped into one, all the 50,000 plus, including Catholicism. If you remove Catholicism from it and separated it, it's even lower. And if I'm not mistaken, last time I checked for this year, it wasn't trending to be even the second one, not even the second fastest growing religion. Which one is the first one? Which one do you guys think? Is the Islam. Now, if you, and then this is speaking generically because in everything there's exceptions in general. If someone mm -hmm. is, um, is born over there in the Middle East and they're in, born in a country that is Islamic, that is part of their life. It's not like with us, we say, you know, I'm a Mexican living in the US and I'm a Christian. 
or I'm an American and I'm a Christian. It's a separate thing, the separate tag that you have on you. For them, it's not. It's part of their life. It's part of their culture. culture. So they take it seriously. I think it's time for us to start taking it seriously too. And, and that we start actually living it out. And that's what I'm, I'm going to try and do uh, in, this, in these sessions, especially th today's. I'm warning you, I hope all of you all had your coffee today because it's going to be a little tedious. I'm going to do my best to keep you guys engaged and follow through the, through the logic. That's when I was saying I need your guys' um, attention really uh, closely. And then to get us started, remember I told you uh, a quote from David Possum. He said, how do we, how should we read scripture? It says that, he says that the scripture reveals its secrets to those who read it. It reverence because we're reading the word of God. It's not just any other book. It's the word of God. So we have to read it in, with reverence, with obedience, meaning willing to obey what you're going to read there. <laughs> And then with a humble and teachable spirit. That is very, very key. Uh, we can unpack that phrase a lot. And last week we said we saw that. We said God is after our hearts, not just what, what we do and how we do it. He's after why we do things. He's looking at our hearts and that's what is his main interest. And then we said that we have to read the Bible in context of the entire biblical narrative of the book that we're reading, the culture, the time, and all of that, right? And I forgot to show you guys one picture to help illustrate that just real quick. But this is called a photo mosaic. Can you guys see that face? Who is that? That's Abraham Lincoln. But if you zoom in, let's just zoom in into his eye. There's a lot of different pictures that make the entire face. And each one of those photos has its own story. Each one of those photos speaks about something that has to do with the life of um, Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, And that's how kind of the idea that I was trying to convey last week. When we read it, we have to know that the book or letter we're reading in itself has a context, has a story. We don't just read the verse and then try to figure out what it means. Read it in the entire context. But also that book and letter fit into the greater biblical narrative. So if you just think about like a photo mosaic like that, it kind of conveys the, the idea that I was trying to say. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And so, yes, we want to know the... We want to know the oracles of the Lord. We want to know what's true. We want to know uh, what he wants us to know and how we're supposed to live. But um, before we do that, we have to approach uh, the, the Bible with, uh, correctly. Now, most of us, when we come to the Bible, we already have some sort of preconceived notion of who God is, what the world is. What, what the Bible says and something, there's already some preconceived notion in our minds. And, um, and we have what's called a, a mindset. Now, a mindset, break the word into, and it's a, it's a mind set on something. And mindsets, I want to uh, explain a little bit to you guys how these ones, how they work, um, so that we're aware of, of it. And, and can do something about it. Because like I, I say also, if you're not aware of something, you can't do anything about it. But if you're made aware of it, you can, you have a choice, you can do something. Okay. So a mindset. Um, actually, we also talked about Romans 12 too, right? We are called to transform, be transformed by the renewing of our mind and not conform to this world. And renewing our mind, yes, there's a the spiritual, the spirit side of it, where the Holy Spirit in us helps us renew ourselves, renew our minds, reveals a word. But there's also a um, more of a, a, a natural thing that happens in our in our brain, in our mind. It's not just like 
God, renew our mind, and he'll just blank it out and put you a new one. We have to do something. The spirit, what, it, what the spirit does is he guides us, he shows us, and then we make a choice. It's not just a wipe it, and I will give you something new. Now, a mindset is formed in every single one of us, and it's, they're formed very quickly, very, very, very quickly. And they're formed by your experiences and your culture, your education, and all of that. For example, the mindset of a Chinese is different than the mindset of an American. And like the few examples I gave you, even the mindset of us Mexicans, it's a little different than the mindset of those in South America, right? And these are formed with what you experience and live. So uh, think about it this way. When you encounter a truth about something, your first encounter with something, that becomes your mindset, that becomes your truth. And that truth is going to go, everything else that you hear about this subject or this experience is going to battle against the first thing that you heard. So any other idea or version of a truth, you're going to compare it with what was yours, the first one. For example, if we raise our kids and tell them like, hey, marriage is between a man and a woman. That is what marriage is. That's what the Bible says. That becomes their truth. That becomes their mindset. And then when somebody else comes and says, no, 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 no. It can be a, a man and a man, or it can be a woman and a woman. This is another idea or another version suppose, of a supposed truth. But my kids are going to have the first one they have. It's like, it's, it's your word against the first thing that I heard. And my mom and dad told it to me, big authority. Plus, they said it's in the Bible and comes from God, even bigger authority. Right? That's why for us parents, we have to be the ones educating and teaching our kids and telling them truth, not just letting somebody else do that because then that becomes their truth and now it's your word against theirs and that's the first thing that they heard and they're like wait this is what they the my truth that i first heard and my mom and dad are saying something else they can still make a choice i mean we can still make a choice and decide to change our mindset right but that is difficult it's not easy it's not easy because these ideas and concepts get fixed in our brain. And next time you go in life and encounter something, naturally your brain is going to go, well, what do we think or what do we know? Or what is our truth about this, this perception that we have? And you're just going to react. Does that make sense? So they're formed very quickly, very easily by your culture, education, friends. By That's why we have to watch what we hear, what, what we see. It's, in, it's in, important. So that we have our mind in the right in the right position. There's a lot to say about that, but um, I just want want you guys to to have that idea because <laughs> some of the things that we're gonna be covering here, they might go against your truth or your mindset or your your original truth. And I can guarantee, I can probably bet that that would be true for about ninety plus percent of us sitting here. I know that was. The case for me but when i was made aware of this and i encounter a, a different truth i at least could stop and process it and think okay let me think this through let me compare let me analyze let me look at things and not just be closed right i've heard um i'm gonna just myself in the case you guys know i was raised in a very uh, traditional Christian household. And so when I came to the U.S. and encountered uh, more non-denominational, charismatic Christianity, that was a chalk for me. I ended up saying I like this and I like, you know, bringing coffee into the sanctuary and being able to not dress super appropriately. I can bring shorts and sandals and I, I changed my mindset. I said, no, this is right. I was wrong. Right. But uh, it was a chalk. And so, unfortunately, most of us come to this book, come to the Lord, come to Christianity with, uh, in most cases, a wrong and incorrect mindset. And so I'm making you guys aware of this so that when I say some things that are different, 
uh, or go against what uh, you have been holding as your mindset, I'm asking that you don't shut down because that's normally what happens. We shut down. It's like, no, nope, this is not true. You know, I heard this other stuff for many years or, you know, I went to seminary four years and I've been a pastor 25 years. Who are you to tell me these things? This is what I learned and so on. And that's where the 50,000 plus denominations come. Like, no, you're, you're wrong. I'm right. What they taught you is wrong. What I, they taught me is right. And there's this battle and pointing fingers instead of sitting down being like, wait, let's, let's uh, go through the scriptures, see if we have the right ideas and mindsets and all that. Okay, so uh, with that, if you hear something, put it, put it, it that is contrary to what you have known or is your truth, put it aside for now. Don't shut down and listen to what I have to say all the way through the end. And it will make more sense. And then you go back into the scriptures, you read it, you analyze it, you study it, and you decide, right? If this is true or if it's not, and, and make a choice, but don't just shut down and be like, no, that's not true. Okay. Um, all right. And we're gonna go into the the mindset that we have, which is. The majority of the world has a Greek or Hellenistic mindset versus the what we see here in the word is a Hebrew mindset. It's, it's not a Greek mindset. It's a Hebrew mindset. Uh, God selected a people, the Israelites, the Jews. He gave them the oracles. He gave them the laws. He explained things to them. He showed them, he told them how they're supposed to live, to be an example to the world and all these things, right? And so that is a mindset with which we should be approaching this book. That doesn't mean we have to become Jews, okay? Because then we can go through the other side of the pendulum and be like, well, now we all have to be Jews and, and, and live exactly like Jews and follow all of the laws and do all this. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we have to have the right mindset and understand the book and the words that are said here, like we covered on the last session, with the right culture. What does this mean to somebody? Or what did this mean to somebody years ago in that culture, on the other side of the world, in the Middle East, in, in Israel? Yes. And, and not what it means to me here in the U.S., how did we get into the mindset? Because we've been talking about, we want to get back to the origin. We want to go back to the book of Acts. We want to be like the original church that Jesus uh, and the disciples left and what he wanted to do like it was originally. Yeah. And saying it is very easy. Even thinking about the idea is like, yes, let's do this. Let's get out of the buildings. Let's go into the houses because access is in the houses. Yeah. And we do that. We get out of the building. We get into the house and we think we're good now. <laughs> but if you guys, as we saw last, last week, it's not just the what we're doing or how we're doing it, but what's at the core of it. And in this case, I would ask, why did we even leave the houses? Why did we even go into the building? Why did we even start doing things differently like they versus what they were doing? That is what we want to tackle so that we can understand and go back to to the origin right because again it's easy and and easy to say but it's harder to do okay so i'm gonna do my best to get us there in the time i got okay so i said god was giving his oracles his truths to his people revealing himself to them mainly through the prophets who spoke to the rest of the people and in our Bibles, the last prophet is Malachi, right? Between Malachi and what we call our New Testament, there's 400 years approximately of time. So when we flip the page from Malachi and go like, Matthew, that's you turning the page to 400 years. Think about it. Now, during that period, it's known as the intertestamental period. 
And somebody say it's like the 400 years of silence because God didn't speak like he was speaking through the prophet saying, say these to my people, say those things. Now, there is a lot of writings that took place in that period that are extra biblical that give us more context and history. Yes, but it's known as a period where like God didn't say this says the Lord and, and go and tell this to my people and so on. During that period, some group of folks called the philosophers rose up. So God didn't speak, so to speak. The philosophers did, or man did. And they spoke a lot, especially three. There, there's a lot of philosophers, but especially three that influenced the entire world. And we are still studying them today. And that is Socrates, his student Plato, and, and Plato's student Aristotle. Aristotle, him, Aristotle. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. They spoke a lot, a lot, a lot. And they were trying to figure out the meaning of life. But that was already here, and God had already revealed it, though. But these guys didn't have that. They didn't have God. So they went on a journey themselves, like, what is life? Why are we here? Uh, where are we going? And all these questions. But they tried to answer those without God. Now, the interesting fact is that Socrates, the first dude, he himself claimed that the knowledge he had and he received and the revelations came from a demon. He said that. And it's not, it's not a secret. You can research it and it's there. Everybody knows it. He was like, yeah, yeah, this demon talks to me and he reveals these things to me. But he didn't think a demon, a demonium was a bad thing. It was just this spiritual being that was giving him knowledge. I don't know about you guys, but I find that very interesting. <laughs> and so he then um, trained or taught Plato, and Plato taught Aristotle. With that, the mindset of the world started changing because everybody looked up to these people. And these people did nothing but go on high mountains and sit and meditate and learn what, what's the meaning of the world. And Socrates had these thoughts from a demon. And then they would go to the, um, I guess today we'll call them like the plazas or whatever, where people gathered and they would start speaking and they would wow people with their knowledge. They're like, whoa, wow. He thought, oh, wow, this is amazing. But they didn't get to any conclusions. They would tell them, come back next week or tomorrow to, and I'll tell you whatever else this demon is telling me. But they have people like that. Whoa, wow, ooh, amazing. All oh, these guys know a lot. Woo. Now, all of that crept into the entire world, and it's in the world today. How many of you at school learned about philosophy and these philosophers? And, and as we'll see, and I'll guide, try to guide us to it, this even crept into the church. Not just the world, it crept into the church. And with that, I want to use an analogy. If our perspective of reality, our perspective of life, our perspective of who God is and what life is and where we're going and, and uh, what is the end of, of everything, what's the beginning, if our perspective of reality changes or is incorrect then we can't be as effective right um, <clears throat> and there is many perspectives of the world also your perspective of life and reality and god and all that affects directly how you live for example a buddhist chinese or vietnamese has a different perspective of the world and truth and reality and who God is and life and all these things. So their life and how they live is different because they live off of what they think is true and the reality and life and all that, right? So if Satan could skew and ruin our perspective and make us have a wrong one, by sending a demon and having that demon talk to this guy Socrates and then phew, send it into the world. 
you have uh, 50,000 plus denominations thinking they're all right and doing things and doing all this stuff and they're being ineffective. And that's exactly what the enemy wants. He's like, I mean, yeah, they believe in God and they go to church and they do these things, but they're ineffective because they're, I already messed up their perspective of reality and who God is and what the end God is. So end goal is, sorry. And we're being ineffective. We're doing and spending time and energy and we're not effective. It's like, if I gather a group of people and give them a manual on how to play football, American football, and then on the board, I'm writing the plays and say like, you know, I don't know how to play football, but <laughs> you know, you go here and then you go there and these are the rules and, and you have to do, you know, a touchdown. Normally I use football, but soccer, yes. which is real football. Yes. <laughs> And, and you gather a, a group of people and, and tell them and give them the rules and do all this. And, hey, this is the game. This is how you play. It's right here. These are all the plays, blah, blah, blah. It starts when, I don't know, when the clock starts, ends with so much. And the goal is to make as much fun, blah, 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 blah. And then I grab them and like, you got it? Yeah. All right, let's do this. And I put them in the basketball court. I'm like, go play football. What's going to happen? <laughs> They're going to hurt themselves. <laughs> And, and, you know, and even like, hey, look, when when somebody hits you, don't stay down, get up. And then your buddies are going to come and help you. Ah, now go play football in a basketball court. It's going to look funny. <laughs> to those who know how football is supposed to be playing, how the field is. But to them, it's not going to look funny. They'll just be like, OK, this is what we learned. This looks a little strange. Where are we going to score? OK, what, what are those baskets over there? And. And then they'll start trying to play football one way or another. And then they'll go back to the rules. Wait a minute, I'm confused. I'm confused, what's going on? Oh, it says it means, I, I probably misinterpreted it then. Uh, let's change the rules. Let's change what it means. I know he said this, but no, I think he meant something else. And we start changing the rules, right? And then you have all these denominations that are trying to play the game in the, in the court and they're all confused. And then some even say, let's stop playing the game here. There's another court right next to it, but we have the right rules. Let's play by these other rules because they misinterpret. I think we didn't understand correctly. And then you got something worse where someone like, forget about it. We're making our own court. And they get out of the basketball court and make something completely different. Do you see where I'm going? And then you end up with 50,000 plus denominations. And Christian believes in, in weird stuff because our perspective was messed up from the very beginning. And like I said, I don't have everything figured out, but I'm going to try and share what I have learned by studying, you know, other very intelligent, smart people that study this, this stuff um, and try to do it in a simple way. But keep this, this analogy in mind. Yep. So <clears throat> there's a lot of world of perceptions of reality, naturalism, Buddhism, and that I'm not going to talk about any of those, just two. Um, starting with, this is what I was debating how to do it, but starting with the biblical perspective. And have some patience. Okay, so yeah, giving you guys an interest. So the philosophical way of, of viewing the world, mainly the way Plato saw the world is what crept into the known world today and the church. So you probably would call it Platonism, right? Yes, a Platonism, so to speak, if we want to call it that way. That is what mainly influenced the church. And that's what the lenses by which we are, most of us reading this word and interpreting things and trying to play the, the game. Okay. But first, we'll do Platonism and we'll do Judeo Christian worldview. We're going to try and look at this one side by side. <clears throat> Which color should I use? Green. Okay. In the Judeo Christian worldview, 
if we open our Bibles in Genesis 1 1, what does it say? It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Plural, heavens, plural. God created the heavens and the earth. And if we look throughout our Bibles, by the way, at the end of this, I can give you, I'll give you some video resources that go more in depth into this that you can study further, and they're amazing. So I'm just going to give you guys like an intro. But um, throughout our Bible, we read that the relationship with, between heaven, the heavens, and the earth is positional, meaning the heavens are on top and the earth is at the bottom it's not what well, i don't know about you guys but for many years i read it and i thought the heavens and the earth two different worlds and i know the earth because i live in it but the heavens is this mystical phantasmal ghostly thing somewhere and uh, that's not what the Bible teaches. That was part of my platonic mindset. But the Bible describes the heavens and the earth, and the heavens are plural, and the earth is singular, not uh, the spiritual and the natural, the immaterial and the material. That's not what the Bible says. It says he, they created heavens and, and earth. Okay? Um, in the New Testament, you can repeat this. Through, but in the New Testament, every time you read the word heaven, it's always plural. In the Greek, it's always our Father in the heavens. Yes. Yes, that's right. There's only six instances in the entire Bible when, um, and it's all in the Old Testament, uh, when heavens is translated into the singular, and it means the heaven of heavens, or in some translations, the heights of heavens. Okay. And that is, okay, I'm, I'm going to go there. That is used to display or to speak about where God, where his dwelling place is and where he has his throne. We're going into more details there. But before we go into that, and just to show you guys the position of relation here, um, let's, I'm going to just read to you a few. A few verses. Um, in Genesis 6, 18, I mean 17. Genesis, Genesis 6, 17, it says, Now I am about to bring the flood water upon the land to destroy all flesh in which the spirit of life, in which the spirit of life from under the heavens. Let me read that again. Now I am about to bring the flood, water upon the, upon the land, to destroy all flesh in which is the spirit of life under the heavens. And so you can see there that the heavens are above and the earth is below. Just another one. De Deuteronomy 4. Verse 39, so you will know today and take to heart that the Lord, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth below. In Acts 1, we see that when Jesus ascended, he ascended, he went up into the heavens. In just one more, Psalm 33. Psalms 33, verse 13 and 14 says, The Lord looks down from heaven. He observes all humanity. From his dwelling place, he gazes on all the inhabitants of the earth. And there's a lot, of, there's a lot of more verses, but that's just a few examples. So in the Bible, the relationship between the heavens and the earth is a positional one. The heavens are always above. And we know that there's at least three heavens. It's plural, and there's at least three. Now, don't ask me where one starts and where the other ends and all that. I have no idea, and the Bible is not clearing that, which means it doesn't matter. There's just, it's just plural. 
That's all we need to know. Um, we know there's at least three because Paul says he was taken up to the third heaven. And some Jewish traditions say there's seven, others say there's ten. It, it doesn't matter. I don't need, for me personally, I don't need to know. Just I just want to know that understand that it's plural and at least there's at least there's three. I'm good with that. <laughs> okay. Now let's just see a few verses of, to explain what I mean by this is a, a throne, by the way. This is not an H. There we go. That's a crown. <laughs> I'm not too good at doing drawings, but uh, let's see. Psalm 102 verse, verse 19, for he looks down from his holy height from heaven. The Lord gazes on the earth. Yes. Psalm 11 verse 4 says, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven or the heaven of heavens or the heights of heavens. Okay. Now, this is an amazing, amazing thing to me when I realized this. God created the heavens and the earth. And they're positional. And the Bible says that God's dwelling tent or his tabernacle <clears throat> and his throne are in the heights of heavens, in the heaven of heavens. So, guys. As opposed to Greek mythology and Platonism and those things where gods are somewhere up there in this other world or other dimension doing what gods do and stuff and completely unrelated to us insignificant human beings. God created everything and then he created a dwelling place for himself in his creation. He took his throne and he put it in his creation. Do you guys get that? He put his throne in the heights of heaven, the heavens that he created. Now, it doesn't mean that that's when he started. He's eternal and he's always been there. He just created everything and then said, I'm going to rule over my creation. And I'm going to do that by putting my throne in the creation that I just made. That is amazing. Because we don't have a God who is distant somewhere up there, who is this ghostly being that can't relate to us and, and we don't know where he is. He is in his creation. And the Bible uh, tells us a lot of verses, a lot in some that Blake and I have been uh, reading, that God is looking from his throne down on his creation on the earth and that he sees the wicked and the righteous. And then it says that when he finds a righteous one, he stops and he inclines his ear to listen to them. And when he sees the wicked, he hides his face from them and he shuts his ears from them. That is amazing. Think about it, guys. God who created absolutely everything, when he looks down on us through through Jesus, those that are born again and that we're walking in righteousness, he gazes down and he says, oh, you know, um, there's Bree, and she's righteous and she's, she's praying to me. I'm going to stop and listen to her. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to incline my ear and hear to what she's saying. That is mind-blowing to me. I don't know for you guys, but to me, it's mind-blowing to understand that. <laughs> And know that God is inside of his creation and he relates to us. And by being here, that doesn't mean he is confined to his creation. It just means uh, somebody used this analogy like me living inside of a house, like my wife and my children. And if I live inside the house, I still rule and have authority and, and sovereignty in, in my house. I'm not. You know, that doesn't make me weak or lose power. I'm just in it. And I'm rela related to my, my children and my wife. And I live with them. It's the same case with God. He's not this distant, ghostly, 
phantasmal god out there that comes from platonism I'll, I'll show you guys that. now before i go into talking to this one more thing the bible doesn't speak about the supernatural and the natural the spiritual and the not spiritual the world word supernatural is not even in our bibles because of this wrong play field like i told you at the beginning we have changed the rule and changed the meaning of of what the bible says and even came up with words that better fit our idea or our perspective of what we think reality and god is and everything but it's not it's not the correct one and we're being ineffective and we're being all confused playing this game we're like what is going on is he listening to me why is he not hearing me why is he not answering my prayers and there's you know that's another different subject but people are these are words that we hear from from believers don't you oh i feel alone where is god i don't feel his love or you know i'm praying to him and i don't know if he's even listening i just told you he looks down on the righteous if you're a believer if you're obeying his commandment if you're approaching him in reverence yes he listens absolutely but maybe we're asking something because of a wrong understanding that we that he can't answer like god why don't you just change my um i pray this for a long time why don't you just change my um my brother and his wife change them change their hearts make them love you and just change them make them follow you he can't do that because that's our choice. That's human beings' choice. He can't go and like, oh yeah, yes, sir, Reuben, I'm gonna change them. Now they love me. <laughs> he can't do that. When I realize that, I'm like, wait a minute, he can't do that. <laughs> what am I asking? That he can't bend his own rules. Well, God, why don't you show them their sin? Can you remove the veil that Satan has in them so that they see the severity of their sin? Can you can you put them in a position where they would have to, you know, uh, be confronted with you and, and, and have to make a decision whether they want to follow you or not? And that prayer, he did answer. That prayer, he did answer. I'm not kidding, guys. Weeks, just weeks, probably even less, but just a, maybe a couple of weeks after I started praying that for a few days, my mom all of a sudden gives me a call like, Guess what, Mijo? You won't believe this. I'm like, what, mom? <laughs> She's like, your brother and his wife, they're going to church now. <laughs> I'm like, what? Yeah, just you know, out of the blue, one day they said they wanted to go to church. And it was her. And she was the one that was most opposed to. Now, full disclosure, she fell off. She's not following the Lord or not. But what I mean is when I started praying the right thing, and everybody was scratching their head. They're like, I don't know. All of a sudden, she woke up and said she wanted to go to church. Do you see what I'm saying? Then you see prayers answered. Then you're like, oh, oh, yeah, God answers. Oh, yeah, he's listening. Meanwhile, there's others that were praying all these weird things. And God's like, no, I can't do that. And we're like, he's not listening. <laughs> so there is no uh supernatural and natural guys the throne of god it's very material and real it's not this imaginary ghostly thing god is not floating somewhere up there in the clouds somewhere out there now i'm going to pause this and now i'm going to explain a little bit of the platonic mindset the platonic mindset this is not exactly like the church and the world doesn't exactly believe that everything Plato said was correct, but his ideas of, of perspective is what they, what the world, what we grab. So he believed that there was two worlds or realities. One that he called the ideas or forms, perfect forms, and then the other one that he called uh the particulars copies basically the e material and the material and in super simplified ways he believed that for example this tool here that we're seeing here is just a 
a corrupted bad copy of a perfect stove that is in the world of the ideas. A perfect incorruptible, uh, you know, without flaws and everything. Obviously people don't believe that, I hope. <laughs> but this thought of the immaterial and the material worlds crept into the entire world and into the, the church. So can I give a, I want you to repeat what I'm saying. Yes. You've heard the statement. Hold on, hold on. I'm just gonna say it. So how many times have we heard this? The spiritual is more real than the physical. I'm literally quote, no. Yes. Okay. You, can y'all see, like my point is we're swimming in this water. You have the immaterial realm and the, and the material realm. So on the earth, these are just the copies, the imperfect copies of what's out there somewhere, somewhere spiritually. So this, is, and that's also, if you've heard of Gnosticism, so Gnosticism came out of Platonism. It's, Platonism, it's the idea that everything physical is bad. Everything physical is corrupt. And it's just not true. That's why God is planning on resurrecting us. If you don't understand this, you think you're going to float away. You, most people think the gospel is pray a magic prayer. Go float on a cloud somewhere to meet some mystical phantom God. And that's what we're trying to undo with this teaching. That's right. Yes. So b before I move on, I hope this is making sense. How are we doing so far? We're doing good? Okay, cool. All right. So in Platonism, this is what he, what he believed. And then Socrates, who heard from a demon, trained Plato. Plato trained Aristotle. Aristotle was the mentor of a guy called Alexander the Great. Who has heard of him? Alexander the Great, because his parents had a lot of money, they paid this tutor, and the most intelligent person in the world at that time was Aristotle, and they said, you're going to be our child's teacher and mentor. And so Aristotle trained Alexander the Great, who conquered the entire world, the known world back then. Alexander the Great conquered the world, and him, trained by Aristotle, he took this philosophical perspectives and mindsets who he believed were, were uh, perfect or more ideal, more pure. And in his conquering the world, he said, everybody has to change their mind, their perspective and, and mold to what my philosopher told me. This is the truth. This is going to be the greater, it's going to make the greater world, the better world, the greater empire. And as he's conquering all the world, he is Hellenizing, it's the term that is used. He's Hellenizing the world. And everybody is now thinking like the philosophers. And they have this perspective. So that infiltrated that way into the world. Okay. And then Rome comes and conquers Greece. But that mindset, that perspective the, of the philosophers was already there in the people. Yes. And the... Then Rome conquers through Constantine. Constantine becomes a Christian, but he's already polluted with also this, this mindset too and this way of thinking. And he just goes about making now the entire world Roman and Christian, but with this wrong perspective. You see what I'm saying? So in this mindset, in the Platonic mindset, where's my... Red marker. If this is bad, this is no, sorry, the other way around. If this is bad, the corruptible, bad, imperfect, and this is perfect. If this were true, where would we want to be? Over here. So with Platonism, everything became about by means of something escaping this bad dirty reality and making it to a perfect pure reality and you know without going further in, in through this it was by either dying and escaping this world or by being very spiritual and going to the spirit and escaping this reality and then you have 
Monks. Monks. Monks who go to the mountains and do nothing but be spiritual. And they pray and they, they're escaping this reality and they're having this, going to these places and this vision. And then you have new age about, you know, thinking and going to your safe place and to, you know, escaping, going to this other world. Do you see what I'm saying? That's what happened with this way of viewing. And then others were like, well, if this is bad and this is perfect and this ends and then somehow we'll go here, then let's enjoy life. <laughs> and then they go into enjoying all the pleasures of life that life has to offer. And it's all about me, about my feelings, my emotions, <laughs> fulfilling my pleasures and having a good time and, and me, 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 everything. Cause in the end, I'm going to die. I'm going to go here where my perfect person is. <laughs> Yeah, Paul said it this way. Let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Yeah. Basically. Can you address? So there's a, I actually kind of answered for you. I did a thus saith Ruben on the, because I just, you and I are tracking on all of this, right? Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit more? Um, Gary was kind of saying like, but isn't the supernatural like the realm where like heaven and earth intersect and doesn't God want us moving in that oh, realm? I'm get there now. Okay. And I just kind of explained like, even the idea of that being separate isn't in the Bible, just like our spirit, soul, and body are all one. Yes. So if you want to elaborate on that, because Gary was mentioning it. Yes, that's actually where I was going at oh. now. So whoops, this happens. There's these two separations. There's the, we want to go here and all that. Okay. That is not in the, in the Bible. Even the thought that we have, listen to me, the thought that we have of, of there's a spiritual realm and there's a physical, natural realm, the way we think it is, is not the correct one. This comes from here. Yes. Now, the heavens are, are, are physical. They're not spiritual in the way we think. They're like intangible, ghostly being. Like most of us think, or not most of us, many people think the world is something like that movie. What did we say it was? Constantine. I watched it when I was not born again, so don't judge me. <laughs> um, but it's a movie where this guy, Keanu Reeves, he, what, he like, he's, he's like a demon hunter or something like that. And so he's walking down the streets of New York or whatever, and it's, he sees people walking and everything. And all of a sudden, somehow he goes into the spiritual realm and boom, everything starts falling down like ashes. And now he sees this other realm, this other reality that's intertwined with the real one and everything falls to ashes. And behind it, there's demons and fire and all these things going around. And we think it's, there's these two dimensions that are mixed. We just don't see one, but they're there and that's not biblical. Can you talk about in, invisible does not mean immaterial? Can you? Yes. So th is that making sense so far? Okay. Like Jeremy said, invisible, which means you can't see, does not mean immaterial, meaning God created the heavens and the earth, but these are more real than what you guys think. Not a spiritual and a natural realm. What he did create is spiritual, or sometimes they're called heavenly beings. And earthly beings. What's an earthly being? Us. What else? This is where you do participate. <laughs> Dogs, animals, trees, birds, sand, everything that is, everything that comes from the, from here, everything that is here. All right. Spiritual beings. Angels, God, demons, principalities, archangels, you name it, there's a ton. What? Cherubim. Cherubim. How do you say it? Cherubim or Cherubim? Cherubim. Cherubim, whatever, those. They're spiritual beings and there is earthly beings, not a spiritual invisible world and a natural visible world. Why don't we see these guys? Because we're here. And if you look up to the sky, 
to the heavens. We can't see all the way here. That doesn't mean it's not there. That doesn't mean it's not real. Does that make sense? It just means they're up there. And we, even though humans, we've been trying to get way up there with rockets and all this stuff, like we can't get up there. Even, even in our imperfect, corrupt, sinful bodies, we can't do that. We would die if we start going up there, right? But these spiritual beings, they're not earthly. They're not made of the earth like we are. They do. They can travel back and forth. They can come here and go up there. But again, that we don't see them, it doesn't mean they don't exist or they're not there or there's a, or that there's this alternative dimension over here. And when you become a Christian, you are heaven on earth. And no, no, that's not, that is not biblical. That comes from this uh, polluted mindset of Platonism. Yes? yes? Is that making sense? Yeah. Okay. So, see, words like heavenly, miraculous, divine. We've kind of scrubbed our vocabulary of words like supernatural because it really just does come from Plato. Right, right. I try to, again, because of our mindsets and our experience and realities. Guys, this infiltrating of Platonism, what I told you about uh, Aristotle training Alexander and then Rome conquering and all that, that happened thousands of years ago. And we've been carrying that all the way to 2023. And so it's become now our new truth, our new reality. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's hard to... To, to get out of it and even see it because we're not told it. That's why I'm here telling you guys this. Because once you know about something, you can do something about it. It's like if, if we, going back to the football players in the basketball court, if we're out there and we know they're in the wrong court, and you go like, ah, guys, this is not what a, a football court should be or field. Let me show you how it should be. It's like this. It's over here. This is how, oh, okay. Then they can do something about it and start playing. Or they can say, forget about it. We've been playing this game for however many years. You don't know what you're talking about. We have the book. We understand it correctly. <laughs> We're staying here. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to do. This other way of thinking is not, it's not there. It's not in the Bible. What has happened to this? Uh, what has happened to Christianity because of this? Like Jeremy said, we start using words that are not in the Bible. Well, we, we've heard them. Even pastors say them. Even these famous ministers who have millions of followers say them. Even these ministers who go to Africa and have million people converted say them. That still doesn't make them right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we have to be very intentional in trying to use biblical language. I might touch a few buttons here, but for instance, inner healing and deeper inner healings. People nowadays are very into, into that. And, and Bree and I were talking about that the other day. And like, oh, what you need is inner healing. You need to go deeper into your inner self and figure out these things. And you need deeper healing of those things. From, from I'm like, do we need to be transformed and renewed and be molded more into the image of God? Yes. Well, then let's say that. Right? Do we need to renew our minds and start walking by the spirit and not by the flesh? Yes. Well, then let's say that. Do we need to learn and change our mindsets to be conforming to the image of God and that we would follow his commandments and be sanctified? Yes. Well, then let's say that. Does that make sense? So being sanctified, walking in the spirit, learning to be led by the spirit, not by the flesh, and all of these things, they are in the Bible. Well, then, then let's, let's say that because then if we use other language, it can become all these different strange things. 
like um yeah inner healing there's a lot of people that do inner healing and they're not necessarily christians does that make sense that's just one example right um okay <laughs> I'm going to erase this and go into something else. Can I erase this now? Yeah. Can I ask a question? Just yes. real quick. Okay. Sorry. Because you've already kind of started going into it a little bit. Um, I know that on the, on related to what you've already been talking about this um, understanding of like spirit, soul, and body being separated through that Platonism uh, uh, understanding that was passed down through intellect and all that um there's there's so many teachings out there uh, that i hear from even christians that oh spirit soul and body this is that and then they define it so specifically like they're so sure but that the bible doesn't talk about it that way but it's is there any more i know you already mentioned a little bit of that is there any more you can define the two uh those two kind of separate mindsets there that's a pretty complicated subject that yeah. would take us a, a lot of time. Be. But what we... But just to be what, aware that there are two different minds. What we want to be aware is when we read the Bible and it says that we're spirit, soul, and, and, and body, we are reading that with the Platonism glasses. And we make a preconceived idea of what that means because of this. Gotcha. Instead of, okay, let me read... Where it says there, and knowing that there's no mystical two worlds, what does he mean by that? And so they try to figure out in that way. Now, what do I think it means with this? Oh, then it's somehow there's three versions of me, and they're somehow together here. And there's like, no, what does he mean by that? And do an effort to, to understand it correctly. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Like, so would you say... When, no, go ahead. I got you. So, uh, would you say, like, in the context of the Bible, when it's being spiritual, it's more or less meaning obedience, being led by the Holy Spirit, and um, loving your neighbor. That'd be more of the context of spiritual being God minded. Kind of? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yes. It's like what I explained with the monks. Right now, we think. Being spiritual is, um, you know, I'm going to go out in the forest and sit down under a tree and close my eyes and just meditate and start thinking about God and, and trying to get a vision and trying to make it to the third heaven and trying to get into the courtrooms and, and bring the decrees of God down into this earth from the courtrooms and then doing with your hands like I'm bringing them down. I'm bringing down the decrees from the court. That's not being spiritual. That's being weird. <laughs> being spiritual means not being guided by exactly what you said, not being guided by your feelings and your emotions and your flesh by being obedient to the Lord. Like if proverb says, um, you know, to guard your lips and not be too quick to open your mouth and look foolish, then just do that. It's an action. It's like by not being too quick to speak and to open my mouth and to be foolish, I am being spiritual. Why? Because I am obeying and I am living by how the spirit is telling me to live. It's what I'm going at. And, and I like your point, Blake, it's, it's way more practical than what we think. Like I can be, um, I can be digging a hole with a shovel in the ground, and be very spiritual when I'm doing it. Instead of man, I wish I were over there praying and singing, and I want to be spiritual. I'm doing non-spiritual things, but if what I'm doing here is you know, maybe helping one of my uh, brothers or sisters in the in the in the church because they have a need in their house and they can fulfill and they can pay for it. I have the ability to go do it, and I'm there digging a hole. I am being super spiritual by digging a hole because I'm doing exactly what the Word and what God says we should do, which is love one another and love my neighbor, especially my church family. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so. Guys, with this, 
by get, and it, it doesn't happen magically, but at least be aware and now start doing things to move away from that platonic mindset. And, and guys, I'm telling you, you start getting closer to God. Uh, like the other day, super simple. And, and if we hyper-spiritualize things, this would be like, oh, that's nothing. The other day, I lost my wallet. I want to use this simple example. What was it? Two days ago, I lost my wallet. And I couldn't find it. And I looked everywhere. Or so I thought. I looked everywhere. <laughs> And I could not find it. I went to the to our car, to the truck. It, my wife's like, did you look in the truck? I'm like, no, let me go there. I'm looking everywhere. I'm like, yes, I looked. Is it there? I'm like, no, it's not there. Can you look in the house? And we're looking everywhere. I can't find it. I can find it. I am freaking out. I'm like, oh, my ID, you know, my American ID, my Mexican ID, everything is in there. Like, oh, what am I going to do? And Kit is like, did you look in the truck? I'm like, yes, honey, like two times already, everything. Oh no, not the back. Let me go look on the back. It's there. It's not there. Ah, oh. so we're looking everywhere, everywhere. Meanwhile, I'm praying like, God, please, please show me where my wallet is. I don't want to have to call all these places and, and call Mexico and wait a year before I can get my ID. And like, please, God, let me find my wallet. And I'm searching and I'm looking. I'm like, God, let me find my wallet. Now, parentheses, before I understood the wrong perspective and the right one, I would have been expecting like, God is going to give me a vision and poof, I'm going to all of a sudden stop and see my wallet in a place and I'll be like, there it is. I'm going to go for it. <laughs> That's totally what I would have been expecting before. I'm, I kid you not. Now, can that happen? Sure, it can happen. But honestly, that is very less common. Now I'm like, please, God, show me, show me, show me. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? And then I get a thought, call your sister. I'm like, call my sister, uh, his wife. They live an hour in Rowland, an hour. From... We were there a week ago. I'm like, call my sister. I mean, yes, I was there a week ago, but I know I brought my wallet with me because I've seen it in the house. Like, that was over a week ago. Why, why call your sister? I'm like, why do I have that thought? Well, okay. So I grab the phone, I call my sister. And she's a lot like me. I tell her I lose my wallet. She's like, no, you lost your wallet. Oh, my goodness. She starts searching all over her house, too. And, and I can hear her over the phone like, oh, Ruben, oh, this is not good. I'm like, I know, sister. I know this is not good. I've been looking all over the place. Like, okay, where did you sit down? You sat down here. It's not here. Where did you guys go? I'm like, I don't know. We went to, and she's going to all the places that I go. And, and I'm also here like, where, where, where? And she's like, did you search your truck? I'm like, I did search my truck three times, all of it, everywhere. I did search my truck. Oh, okay. I'm just saying, did you search well? I'm like, I did search well. Every the globe compartment. I even did some cleaning. I'm like, I'm like, I almost vacuumed just because I didn't have a vacuum, but I was about to. And I'm like, and I don't. I kid you not. I don't know why, but I'm. I start walking towards the truck and she's like, oh, maybe. And she's like, you went to the bathroom. I'm like, I don't think it's there, but yeah, I go to the bathroom. And I'm walking to the truck. I, like, yeah, I search my truck. I open the door. I mean, I search everywhere. And she's like, oh, no, what are we going to do? I'm like, I don't know. Then I look over at the door. They're on the side. And I'm like, uh, sis, I found it. <laughs> so you found it? Oh, praise God. I like, Oh, thank you. And I'm like, oh, yes, thank you. And they go and grab it and I put it in here. She's like, oh, thank you. Thank you. I hang up and I'm like, wow, thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you, God. Because I knew I didn't leave it at my sister's. So when the thought came, I called her. My first time, I'm like, it's not there. But I'm like, wait a minute. Maybe this is something. Do you see what I'm saying? And I didn't get this vision like your wallet is on your truck. Oh, whoa, it's there. Let me go. That, that situation that happened right there was totally God speaking and guiding me and telling me, call your sister. You're not listening to me right now because <laughs> I've told you through your wife a lot of times. It's in the truck and you're not listening. Call your sister. She'll tell you the same thing. <laughs> And finally, I'm like, okay, I'll go to the truck. And it was right there. Does that make sense? Yes. 
Um, <clears throat> so that is what living by by the spirit is. Um, another just example. I just want you guys to. I just want to make you guys aware. There's. I read a lot of books at the church that we used to go to in Portland. Uh, they had these workshops they call them workshops and they had like different subjects discipline and fasting and all this stuff we went to a prayer one because we wanted to know how to pray and what to pray and they gave us books of our intercessory prayer and warfare and spiritual warfare and all those things and i was reading them and we didn't know we were searching for the truth and we started doing several things that they that they teach in those books and these people, these uh, very famous ministers teach these things. And um, I remember when we went to the ark, sorry, the in North Carolina, TLR school, we looked in school. Mm -hmm. And when we came back, a brother from that church found out we went there and long story short is he wanted to meet with me and I shared everything. I told him, hey, we have to be disciples. We have to be doing these things. And, and he was like, no. No, I'm a, I am an intercessor. And I'm like, okay, that's my ministry. He said, I'm like, okay, what does that mean? He's like, I, I pray. Like I wake up and I pray for three hours a day. And then I go, he was a teacher. And then I go and teach and then I come back and then I keep praying. I have a list and like, what do you need me to pray about? I'm like, I don't know what, what yeah, cause I'm going to put you on my list and I'm going to be praying and fighting for you and, and interceding for you now. Do we want others to pray for us? Yes. Absolutely. I, you know, while in South America, I called a lot of people, uh, Jeremy, Sean, I think I even put it on Discord and say, guys, pray for us. This is going on. And right. But what this guy did was just wake up and pray, 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 and, and, and pray against all these things and pray against the principalities and praying against the, the angels and, and then he would be too exhausted because he's been praying for three weeks or three hours and wouldn't go out and evangelize. Wouldn't want to come out and, and, and do Bible studies or anything like that because his ministry was to pray. You see what I'm saying? Then we're being ineffective. We're trying to play a game that is not there, uh, that, that is not meant to be played like that. Um, in Argentina also... Some people were showing me some videos in Spanish, uh, what I, I'm sure we can find them in English, where people were doing deliverance. <laughs> it was so strange. It, it, there was this guy who sat down, somebody down, and he's starting to talk to this person. And, and all of a sudden, he's like calling out angels, like, angels, come and, and uh, cut Leviathan's tail with your swords. Angels, I command you, come and tie him down and cut the scams out of his, his skin. I want him to suffer. Angels, make him suffer. And the person that's been delivered is like, ah, screaming. And they're like, yes, feel it. I want you to suffer. I'm like, what is this guy doing? I'm not kidding you. There's a, I can show you the video, but it's in Spanish. <laughs> and he, and he's, he's calling angels to tie down this Leviathan and to cut his tail and to cut the, the, from the fish, the things. Scales. scales, thank you. To cut the scale and to, with his sword, tie him and then squeeze. And then one was like, cut his head off, make him suffer. I'm like, <laughs> what's going on here? But he thinks he's doing spiritual warfare and he's raging against this demon that is in this person. Guys, that is not, I'm sure the demon was having a lot of fun with him and the person who's being tormented. Yeah. Right? But that's not, that's not, that's not in the Bible, guys. Fantasy. Huh? It's fantasy. That's it's fantasy. fantasy. That comes from fantasy. Plate. That comes from the Platonic mindset, thinking that there's these two worlds and that we get to fight in the spiritual ones. That's not how it happens. We're here. What's in the Bible, remember, demons were manifest when Jesus was there. Mm -hmm. uh, and they will say, Son of God, don't torment us. Mm -hmm. Because they acknowledge. Right. But that's in the Bible. 
right? He was talking about the the day of the Lord when he's going to come back and send them into the lake of fire, into eternal torment. That's what he's talking about because he said, have you come have you come before the appointed time to torment us? Which means they know who he is and they know that when he comes into the scene uh, on the day of the Lord, that he's going to judge everyone and they know their judgment is coming and that they're going to be sent into the lake of fire to be tormented oh. forever. So they're like, what are you doing here before the appointed time? Are you here to torment us? To, not to torment us in the way like this guy was telling angels to torment this Leviathan. <laughs> but in the context of, are you coming here to send us into the lake of fire to bring that judgment that we know is coming? That's what, that's what it's meant. That's why he, that's what he means there. Even that Platonic mindset has come into the charismatic church, even with those scriptures of like, no, heaven is meeting earth, and it is the appointed time. It's have you come before the appointed time? The appointed time was Christ on the cross, and now we get to take mm -hmm. heaven to earth and we get to torment demons. And it's like, actually, no, it's talking about the day of the Lord after the seven years of tribulation. There's an actual time period and a time frame. It's not the spiritual thing of we are now little Christs and we get to go and torment these demons and we get to snatch people from hell. And it, that's not, that's not a thing. Sheol is where people are held. We're not sending people or taking people out of hell. We are just casting out demons. And that is actually supposed to be prophetic to the day of the Lord when the Lord comes and wipes the earth clean. It's yes. not a spiritualized mindset of, we get to go and do all these cool spiritual things. It's That's actually, right. no, we are prophetically speaking into the day of the Lord, a specific time period, not a spiritual mindset. It's an actual literal day and a literal time frame mm -hmm. to that day. Yes, that is correct. You shall cast out and cast out is actually drive out, which is forcefully. He told us to heal the sick and cast out. Or drive out right Amen. he did sure. that is that is true so what happens if you cast out a demon they come out out of that person's body yeah what is your question then no i just commented on what um she said the day of the lord and i said it's uh looked at it's in my name it's the authority that he gave, he gave us and it's it's for now while we are before the day of the lord it was just a comment right but like she said that's a that's a prophetic sign of what's to come so when we go out to and tell people hey look and do we need this spirit we're going out there telling people hey jesus died but he's resurrected this jewish jewish person came he died he resurrected he's in heaven he has all authority on earth he's coming one day to judge the living and the dead right and he's coming for those who are you know, if there, if you are not found in him, then you're going to be judged and, you know, and then he's going to establish his kingdom where there's no, no sickness, there's no pain, there's no sadness, there's no, excuse me, there's no uh, demons, there's no, no more, courage, no, more, no oppression from demons and all these things, you'll be like, what? But then you cast out a demon from someone them or somebody and they see it and they experience it like what i'm telling you is true what just happened is a sign of what i'm telling you this is a confirmation of that day that is to come so yeah jesus they absolutely he gave us authority to do those things we're not saying we're not supposed to do them or that we can't do them it's we means, can it's what it means when it happens yes what it means and what is the right context and perspective of what's happening of mm -hmm, of what is happening but absolutely we have to go and do those things because jesus told us to to go do them 100 percent. yes so kind of the simple like answer you would say is like right so the kind of the simple thing you would say is that we have been given an authority to cast out the demons but the authority to send them into torment would be Jesus. Yeah. We don't have that authority, and nor should we even try to exercise that authority of even commanding angels, because we don't even have authority over angels. We have authority over demons, which are actually separate. Yes, right? that's right. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay. 
So guys, what I am not saying is we don't cast out demons. They don't exist. They're not in people. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we have to see all these things with the right perspective, with the right mindset, in the right playing field, the biblical one and not the our platonic one. Like I've heard people cast out demons and say, I'm sending you back into hell. The lake of fire is, is not, it's, it's not a real thing yet. She all is, but the lake of fire does, does not. So does that make sense? And they're like, I'm sending Satan back into the lake of fire. He's not there yet. You can't send him back if that's not there. Does that make sense? But because of our wrong perspective and mindset, we're acting and playing football in a basketball court and doing this, that if real football players that are in the real court will see, you know, like, why are you guys doing these strange things? Does that make sense? Yeah. So again, we just have to be aware of it and be like, let's, let's talk and see and read the Bible with the right perspective, with the right lenses, with we cast out demons with the right understanding, right? We pray with the right understanding. And like Blake said, we don't, we can't, like this guy, I don't know where he got the idea that he can command angels. Now, can we pray and be like, and I actually did this prayer uh, last uh, Sunday or recently. Can we ask like, Jesus, please protect this person. Like protect them physically. Do not let any harm come to them. Like, can you? Would you send your angels to surround this person and 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 cover her and protect her and keep her from any harm? That prayer he can answer. Does that make sense? What's that? Only through him. I can ask him, and he's he's going to listen, and he can do that because he has the authority over everything over on, on on the heavens and on earth i don't i can use his name to cast out demons to heal people in his name in his authority and things happen why because as a prophetic confirmation mm -hmm. of the message that we are sharing with people as a sign of the message that we're sharing with people that jesus came died and resurrected and paid um and made a way for us to live forever in eternity when he comes back on the day of the Lord and establishes his kingdom and everything that is yet to come. Does that make sense? And that has made me just like, I feel more closer to God now than when I did years ago when I was just trying to seek him. I'm like, how do I relate with this God who is, because we're told he's, he's above heaven, he's above, like outside of this whole realm and He's somewhere out there where there's no time and there's nothing over there. Like, how do I relate to that? And we can't, and many people can't, because that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not who, how God is or who he is. Make sense? Mm -hmm. And not only is he in his creation and we can relate to him, he sent his son, Jesus, who he now relates to us in our suffering. So he's in his creation, and then he sends his son, Jesus, to die for me, to not just say he loves me, to show it and demonstrate it. And now I can also know, like, wow, Jesus can even relate with my sufferings and my struggles and my challenges. This is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. I, I, I feel closer to him. I know, I can say I know him more. Like, in a relationship, not, not just in my mind, like you know, if he wants, I will, if I'm praying the wrong things, he, he won't. Yeah? Okay. Um, I'm going to use just one more example. Um, is it in Daniel 10, Jeremy? Where Daniel prays? Or 11? Or nine. Where he prays and then. Yes, the Lord. Daniel 10. Daniel 10. This, this, I read it in an intercessory praying book that I used to love, but now I threw it away. 
<laughs> ¿Te acuerdas? <laughs> Here Daniel is praying. Right? And let's go to chap uh, chapter 10, verse 12. Or, or 10, verse 10. Then behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said to me, Daniel, highly valued man, carefully consider the words that I'm speaking to you. Stand up, for now I have been sent to you. When he spoke this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, don't be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. From the first day, your words were heard. I have come because of your words. However, the prince of the kingdom of Persia resisted me for 21 days. But behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I had been detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future days, for the vision concerns days yet to come. While, I was speaking the, while he was speaking these words to me, I bowed my face toward the ground and was speechless. And blah, 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 it continues, it continues. So picture these guys. Daniel prays, and God sends someone to answer his prayer. Daniel prays, some, God sends someone. When? Immediately, he said, I have come because of your words. Uh, basically, oh, my drawing is gone. Daniel is praying on earth. God, because he's righteous and he's a man that he listens to, he sends someone to help him. This angel gets detained by another spiritual being. This spiritual being is detained by another spiritual being, which is refer referenced here as the king of per the, the prince of the kingdom of Persia. And he holds him for 21 days until Michael comes and helps him and says, now you can go. All of this is happening where? In the heavenly realm. Or in, the heavenly, uh, in the heavens. Way up there. So Daniel can't see it. It doesn't mean it's not happening. So Daniel is here praying, praying, praying. Right? And 21 days later, this angel can say, hey, look, Daniel. From the moment you opened your mouth, I was sent. But someone stopped me. And then Michael came and helped me. And now I'm finally here. Does that make sense? So Daniel is down here. He's, he's not seeing what's going up there. It's real. It is a fight. It's there in the heavens, spiritual beings doing stuff. But Daniel is here not seeing it. And then when finally he's released, he comes to him and says, I was sent from the very beginning. Right? That doesn't mean Daniel's prayer was doing something up there with them. Because <clears throat> with these things, I've heard... Uh, or like in that book I was taught, you pray and you pray and you pray. And it's basically as if you're play, playing a video game. And like I grab my spiritual sword and I cut you down. And then I grab my my lasso and I tie you. And I, you know, that, that kind of thing. It doesn't happen. It's Daniel is praying. Something's happening up there. But God answered the prayer immediately. Right? Or Paul, when he goes to Athens. And he walks there and he sees all of these idols and all of these things to these gods. And he says his, he was fired up in his spirit. And what he didn't do is walk to the middle of the plaza and start praying against all these idols and these principalities and casting them down and, and tying them and cutting them down with his spiritual sword and all these things. He didn't do that. He walked in there and saw this thing, and his spirit was arose. So what does he do? He go into the he went into the synagogue and he went into the public places and started talking to as many people as would listen. Doing what? 
<laughs> preaching the gospel and even telling them, hey, guys, I know you're very religious and very spiritual. You even have this one, uh, this thing for an unknown God. I'm coming here to tell. So he's being, he's being smart and he's preaching. Some follow and some were like, whoa, what is this new thing that you're, that you're teaching us? Because they were used to philosophers and just philosophizing new things. Like, we never heard this thing and it's interesting and we want to hear more. And others mocked him and said, nah, this guy is crazy. Don't listen to him. Does that make sense? Do you have a question? I have a, a, a just a few online comments slash questions with some scriptures. Um, one was pertaining to just sharing in the divine nature that Second Peter chapter one talks about, and kind of maybe um, what is he talking about? It sharing in, in that divine nature is it changing something, or is that just uh, is that relating to our our position with God? Um, I'll let you do that one. Then I have two more, um, real quick after that, that I think you'll be able to, where is that one? Um, I'm not sure which verse, uh, he said second Peter chapter one. I didn't, I didn't go to find the verse, but it's just talking about, um, through the promises of God, we have come to partake in God's divine nature. Um, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and virtue. Amen. Through these things, he has given us his precious and magnificent promises. Amen. So that through them, you may become partakers of the divine nature, since you have escaped the corruption that evil desires have brought into the world. What do you guys think that's talking about? Yeah, I mean, it's it's actually Romans 6, right? So we've been buried with Christ. Our old nature's been buried, right? So through his divine nature, by his spirit, we, we are partakers overcoming. In other words, we're not slaves to sin anymore. Exactly. We're not, we're not being we, corrupted by sin. We, so. we have been buried and dead and we're resurrected to walk in newness mm -hmm. of life. What does that mean? Walk by the spirit, yeah. not by the flesh. Amen. Obey the spirit. Live how God wants you to live by the spirit, not by the pleasures and patterns and wisdom of this present evil age. So we are partakers of that in that when we're walking in the spirit, when we're walking in newness of life. And on the day of the Lord, we will 100% partake in that divine nation when we get uh <laughs> spiritual bodies like first corinthians 15 mm -hmm. says which spiritual bodies does not mean what many people think it means but it is there it says we're getting spiritual bodies but we immediately go to the platonic mindset and be like whoa i'm gonna get like this ghostly spiritual no that's not what it means that's just what you're understanding yeah because of your wrong perspective mm -hmm. <laughs> good yeah to earth that is clean. yeah Okay, thank you. And then Michael was uh, had a few really good comments. He wasn't he uh, he wasn't debating, but he was really forming it in a in a in kind of like processing through this. And he he also brought up a couple other verses that was really good. Um, Luke chapter eleven verse twenty four kind of talks about unclean spirits, and he says that when an unclean spirit has gone out from a person, passes through waterless places seeking rest, finding none, it says, "I'll return to my house." from which I came. And when it comes back, it finds a house sweat and put in order. And then we know the rest of what he was saying. How do we reconcile that um, as far as what we see and what we don't see? And then he brought up in this other um, that he brought up, uh, brought up in this other scripture that really pairs well with that one is actually from the old Testament talking about second Kings six seventeen. He says, I'm thinking of Elijah praying to open the eyes of the servants to see the angels and the angels armies. Right? So there's something that's there that they can't see. And he's praying that they would see, or like, or like, what about the donkey that Balaam's donkey, right? That he didn't see there was an angel standing there. So there's this realm that's unseen, but that doesn't necessarily, or this, there's this place, there's a place that's unseen. Yes. <clears throat> and so, I know the place, I would call it a being. A so, being. Okay. So, so here's the thing. That's what I'm asking, and I'm not trying yeah, to define it. I'm not trying to define it. <laughs> no, I agree. Okay. I'm tracking with you. Thank you. <laughs> so once again, <clears throat> Because of the Platonic mindset, we think this. 
spirit natural and there's something here and we don't see and there's this realm this constantine movie way of thinking the middle part where heaven meets earth and then we think heaven and earth are one and then one day boom they're both be one and once again this comes from the platonic mindset like we said at the beginning is there spiritual beings yes it is earthly beings yes but they're real it's not this other dimensions interflowing that we have to be spiritual to see them or have our third eye and spiritual eyes open to finally see oh i see the stuff that is going on here <clears throat> i'm going to be perfectly honest and maybe jeremy can help here why do we not see uh, the angels and the, the demons and these spiritual beings i am not 100 percent sure but what i have heard is some theories and i'm going to give you two examples and jeremy maybe you can expand on that from scientists, not just religious people, scientists have done studies and there is scientific beliefs uh, that uh, essentially, I think I have it here. The reason why we don't see these spiritual beings, oh, astrophysics, not scientists, people that study astrophysics, which means they study the nature of light. That's, that goes way beyond my head and my knowledge. Um, and due to studies, even done in, in Yale and things like that, there's um, one, there's evidence that the speed of light is actually decaying. And two, they think angels and God and these spiritual beings are invisible because they function beyond the speed of light. Now think about it. It does make sense to me, but look, if the heavens are, like, look up and how far can you see? Take a telescope and how, how far can we see? All this technology that we have and how far can we see? And, and God is sitting in the heights of heaven. He's way, 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 way up there. We just can't see. Now that's, how does it call uh, light years distances? That's what they call them, right? Yet, when God sends an angel, boom, they show up immediately. How can that happen? It's like, does, does that make sense? Like, God sends an angel, says, go help, and they're here immediately. How did they get from here to here that fast? It's not teletransportation and those kind of, We might see it that way, or it might feel that way, but it's, yeah. it, it's because they, they're not bound to like we are bound does that make sense so when when elijah prayed opened his eyes what happened i don't know what i do know didn't happen is boom he got to see this mix of uh side parallel realm that is there but he couldn't see so there was some, it was something with elijah so do you guys remember when in, in luke 21 after the resurrection it says jesus appeared to them in a different form mm -hmm meaning he's right in front of them walking with them right right but they don't perceive him they think he's a regular man right so it's so he said elijah says open his eyes because elijah obviously saw them mm -hmm. <laughs> right or he was aware of them he at least perceived they were there meaning they were interacting with the physical like if they weren't physical how could they protect them from those guys yes right and so there's this reality where we can't perceive them and I think there's lots of reasons. The speed of light thing is one. I know if many of you guys know who John Paul Jackson was. He was like one of my first prophetic mentors. And he would mentor pastors who were having dreams and visions and didn't believe in the Holy Spirit. Mm. And they were contacting him from all over the world. And one of them had a son who was like, it seems like my son's interacting with some kind of spiritual being, some kind of angel. I'm not sure, but I can't see him. I'm, I, I'm kind of freaked out by it. And John Paul just told him, like, hey, go and ask your son about it. And he said, you know, son, if this is real, can you ask the angel why I can't see him? And he turns around. This is a four-year-old, right? Four-year-old? Four-year-old. And he asks, and he goes, hey, my dad wants to know why. And he goes, it's because your eyes have been held too much evil, dad. <laughs> and so then he, and he just, but the, it was the idea. He actually kept talking to the angel. And was like, and it wasn't, John Paul wasn't like, we should all be talking to angels. The point was, there's something about us. That as we as we grow in purity and in innocence, we're able to perceive God and perceive 
um, he, he, you know, who he is and, and those around him. So it has, it has something to do with us. And also even John, you guys remember how, how holy the apostle John was? It says, I was in the spirit. And all that means is I was under the power of the influence of the spirit in a unique way that caused me to see the resurrected Christ in a vision or caused me to see what's going on in the heavenlies. Yeah. Um, and so we need the spirit to help us um, to see these beings. Yes. That's good. That's right. Jesus in the mountain of transfiguration is another, great. another example. Um, scientifically proven there there are different speeds so there's speed of light speed of sound and actually darkness um which is the opposite of light has its it, it has, you know, <laughs> so if you hear about like wormholes or like when a sun collapses it creates darkness where that that actually shadow and darkness have its own speed as well and so in the Bible, it says that he is the way, the truth, the life, but it says that he's the light of the world. So if you look up the speed of the sun's light rays, each star, its light goes at, to a certain distance because it travels at the speed of, of light. And depending on how big it is, if God is light itself, of course, he's going to span the whole universe. He also spoke it to existence and the and sound has a speed each sound wave has a different speed to it so if you look into that that's why we don't see we don't see sound we don't see the wind there are certain things that are very tangible that we don't see right. but it does not mean that it's in a different realm or universe Great it's very example. much here yeah, the ever yeah. Ever. Mm -hmm. yeah the good one. Like, don't you don't see, see yeah you're right of life. that's true man. there's very yep. many things you don't see germs you don't see molecules you don't see everything that makes but it's very real and it's very tangible you put your fingers together, you're feeling molecules, you just don't know it because they're so small. Do you have your hand up or yeah. are you resting? Yeah, well, I'm resting. Like, oh. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't know if he was like just oh, relaxing this, or uh, this, and I'm like, oh, I'm tired. Okay. <laughs> but like, and you know, so it's not one thing, I mean, like, because we see through scripture, we see angels coming and talking to people, and they're like, oh my goodness, like, what is this thing? Mm -hmm. you know and then they're terrified and they'll be like oh don't bow down to me i'm not god you know and then also we have even that very horrible sense of the nephilim where the angels delighted in uh the women right. and came and uh slept with them and then right. burped out the nephilim so it's not like it's impossible to see them it's just maybe when they're working it's impossible because they're moving so at a speed that we can't yeah. comprehend possibly yeah, and to be honest, all of those, that was some great information, you know, but that those things I haven't looked into in that much detail and goes way over my head. But at least I, I know, I, I, I'm aware, and it's like, it's not this intertwined dimension, it's something else. Yeah. And it just, it, guys, it helps you be more effective. It helps you play the game more effectively. It's helped my prayers and my wife and I, we talked about this all the time. In recent years, when we came to this understanding, we see more prayers answered. Now, is God listening more? No, I'm just praying more realistic prayers, more in line prayers with the Bible and all that. Yeah. Okay. And that's what we want to do. Uh, I can give you guys some other resources, some other videos to watch that go more in depth into these. They're pretty interesting. Uh, um, me personally, I had to watch them like a couple times, some of them, because it, I didn't get them at the beginning, but they're really good. If you're interested, I can give you those, but let's close with, <clears throat> so in, in light of the correct, in the biblical perspective and having the right mindset, that of a, a, the Hebrew mindset, not that of a Greek of separate things like the, to the Hebrew, uh, in light of this correct perspective, um, <clears throat> Basically, God is supreme and not man. To the philosophers, man was supreme. Now we have a very self-centered gospel religion. When the, when, when the gospel, the message is about God and Jesus, it's about him. The word is about him, not about us. Yeah. yeah. Everything is about what he's doing, what he did, 
and what our role in that is not about what I want to happen, what I want him to do, what I want my life to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. In the Hebrew mindset, uh, in our mindset, knowledge is power. In the Hebrew mindset, God is supreme and Jesus has all authority and every knee will bow to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the Greek mindset, we think the more intelligence, the more information I have, the, the more stuff I know about God, the better I am. In the Hebrew mindset, the biblical mindset, you have to know him and obey him, not just about him. You can, in our Greek mindset, you can say, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. Do you believe he died and was resurrected and he's the son of God? Yeah, I believe it. Just like I believe Abraham Lincoln was alive and he was the 16th president. I believe that too, but that's not enough. To the Hebrew, it's like if you believe in him in your mind and you believe he is real and, and, and if you seriously do believe everything he says is true, then you will adjust your life to reflect that reality. Does that make sense? All of these things start affecting, like, okay, if that's a correct perspective, then I should better do something about it and really show it, not just, yeah, I believe in him. And does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so to close it here, everything starts with heaven and earth and God sitting on a throne. And then at one point, human beings sin. Yep. And everything is now messed up. But God sent his son Jesus to die for us. To save us from our sin. And one day, he's going to come back on the day of the Lord. And establish his kingdom on earth. This is an oversimplified way of how, how things started and where things are going. And everything is going to... <clears throat> also, by the way, this time here, it's called the present evil age. Or this silence. world. And then here is the age to come. The Bible just splits time in two. Present evil age, the age to come. And everything is heading this way on to this day, to the day of, of the Lord, when everything will be uh, the restoration of all things happen. And restoration is going, is, is the rack in the middle, window of mercy. Yes. <clears throat> so here, mercy and grace. In this age, what we are experiencing is God's mercy and grace. Before this time, when he comes back to judge the living and the dead. So even, even what we perceive to be bad things. Oh, I have a good example. Even what we perceive to be bad things happening to us, it's still God's mercy and grace. Because here, he's going to completely annihilate the wicked. And here he's giving us a chance and doing everything he can to make us see our state and that we get to him or turn to him from our, from our wicked ways, from our own knowledge and understanding and pleasures, that we could get united with Jesus through baptism. He can send us his spirit. Like um, in Mexico, there was this, uh, um, this lady that we've known for years in my family, and she got very sick um she was uh in catholic and very proud and very wanting to prove everyone that she was good at sports and doing everything you know very me centered like look at me look at me look at me she got sick with a disease that they don't even know what it is they don't know how to call it nothing but she um like her blood doesn't flow correctly in her body um she had a mini stroke and all of a sudden she couldn't run and do marathons and she would invite everyone like, oh, look at me, I'm going to win this marathon and call everyone, look, I'm super, super good. And 
she was married and didn't want to have kids because no, first I got to enjoy life and succeed in everything and business and work and, and marathons and all these things. Then this happens to her. And I, now they tell her, you can't have kids. And she was like, what? Now, not only she can't have kids, if she stands up and walks too long, that's that she gets tired, dizzy, feels bad, has to go back, lay down in bed. Like she can't do much things. And I'm super simplifying this, but all these bad things are happening. Apparently in her health. She calls my family because she knows these guys are Christian. And well, I've heard that they pray for people, they get healed. And she starts going to my mom's and talking to they already knew them, but, you know, hearing about the word, hearing the gospel, they're praying for her, praying for her, nothing happens. Now she wants kids, and now she can't have them. She's like, oh, how was I so selfish? Oh, they're praying, praying for her. But where I'm going at is this sickness, instead of her turning and lifting her fist against God and saying, you, why did you do this to me? I was so successful. Uh, why do you not heal me? Oh, thank you. Like, why, why God, why me? Why are you so mean? Why you hate me? She was like, man, I've been so selfish. I've wow. been so self-centered. I was only thinking about myself and trying to prove everybody how great I was. Like, even my husband, he wanted kids and I kept denying kids to him. And she's like, the only one that can help me now is God. And she started going and hearing the gospel. And she's like, wow, God can help me. God can help me. They're praying for her. Nothing is happening. I'm, I'm telling you guys, nothing is happening. But she's not lifting her, her face. She's like, God, you can help me, please. I want to have kids. Please help me. Please help me. She paid millions of, uh, well, thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of pesos <laughs> uh, in treatments to try to get pregnant. Nothing is happening. And, well, I'm going to shorten the story. One day, she's going to get this special treatment to see if maybe. They can do something. That's on Friday. On Thursday, she meets with my family. They pray once again. And it was something with the with her eggs. She didn't have enough. And they prayed and prayed like God give her more eggs and this and that. Friday, she goes to her regular treatment. And they were like, you have three eggs. You know, technically speaking, we can't do that. But I'm your... The doctor was her relative, she's like, and he's like, and I own this place, I say what they do, so we're going to do it even with three eggs, the minimum was seven, and he's like, we're going to do it, I'm the owner, <laughs> she gets there on Friday, and they, okay, let's do this, and they look, and they're like, wait a second, there's, there's 12 eggs, and I think that Tuesday, if I'm not mistaken, they had done the test and she's like, what? The doctors, the nurses and doctors are like, oh, our equipment broke when we did the first analysis. What did we do wrong? And they're going, trying to see what did we do wrong with our equipment? All these millions of dollars equipment, wow. what's going on? And they're trying to do all these things, trying to figure it out. And she's seeing it and she's like, you guys are not going to find anything. And they're like, but, but we saw it. Did we do this correctly? Did you do this correctly? Did you really use the right? They're fighting between them. And she's like, hey, hey, stop it. Like, stop. It. You guys are not going to find anything. And they're like, what are you talking about? Do you guys believe in God? She tells them. They're like, yeah, yeah, we believe in God. Well, this is a miracle. God did that. And she tells them, yesterday, they prayed for me. And today, I have 11 eggs. What else do you want? <laughs> so needless to say, she goes to the treatment. She gets pregnant. It's a very, very dangerous treatment. She's going through some hard stuff. Like hard. Not only can she lose the baby, she can die. She's very weak and she's going. But all this time, she's like, God, God, you can help me. You can help me pray for me. And, and then we went and shared the gospel with her again. And at one point, she's looking at us, just crying. And she's like, this is what we need. Yeah. Remember, she looks at her husband. She's like, what else do you want? Jesus is, right? She, what else do you want? Jesus is calling us. We, this is what we need. We need Jesus. Like, he saved you from that accident. Now I know. And he saved you from that other accident. He starts still in the husband. And now, we didn't baptize them or anything. But she was like, we have to do this. I want to get baptized. And. 
and the other ones were like, let's think about it. But anyway, the point is somebody would have taken that situation and been like, God does not exist. Why did he allow this to happen to me? I can die. I am not going to have kids. And this is horrible. And, and I don't believe in God and just lift his face and walk away from him. But she did the opposite. Right. And now God did not heal her. And, and I think at one point she said, if he would have healed me, I would probably go back to my self-centeredness, egocentric lifestyle that I have. But this is that is keeping her humble and seeking God. Does that make sense? So everything that happens in this age, no matter what we think about it, it's God's mercy and grace. Now, granted, sometimes it's results of our dumb decisions, but we still get to experience his mercy and grace. But there's going to be a day when he will, on the day of the Lord, when he will come and judge. And that's a different story. And that, my friends, we will look at next week.